by a show of hands. How many people here are Americans? Oh, that, that's fantastic. That's great. Because, you know, we're the best, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's usually sarcastic when people say that now. People look at this greatest country on earth from the outside, but we can see from the inside that it has problems, and growing problems. We have 46 million people in poverty. That's the largest percentage that we've had since uh, 50 years ago, according to the U.S. Census. And wages have been stagnant for the last 30 years. They haven't changed more than 5% adjusted for inflation, according to Pew in 2014. And I could go on. Our education quality, healthcare costs, racial inequality, income inequality, trade deficit, budget deficit, we really got it covered. And Americans are understandably frustrated. Uh, according, according to a Pew survey in November, both Democrats and Republicans agree that the economic system in this country unfairly favors special interests. And according to Gallup, we have one of the least popular Congresses in history. Our Congress is covering around 11% popularity, which the historic low in 2011 is not. We're people looking for an outsider candidate. We're sick of the system, and we want someone who can come in and basically smash it with a hammer. Being an insider now in politics is a dirty word. These people are largely using their own authority, their own personalities to attract people, instead of the sort of bills and long speeches that have drawn people for them. I'm here to persuade you that perhaps that's not the best way to go, and perhaps we should look for an alternative to these large candidates that are very dynamic. Around the turn of the century, Max Weiber, a sociologist, discussed what he called charismatic authority. Later, sociologists would deem it charismatic leadership. It's a sort of irrational authority. It's based on how you can make your followers feel, as opposed to other types, which are either bound in law, tradition, or your ability to take or receive based on how well people follow. After the start of the century, we've had quite a lot of time to research this. Dorothy Wilner, another famous sociologist, has studied world leaders throughout the 20th century. And she came up with four basic premises of these sort of leader-follower relationships coming from charismatic authority. First, the followers believe that the leader is somehow superhuman. Second, they blindly believe the statements of the leader. Thirdly, they unconditionally comply with calls to action from this leader, and fourthly, they offer unequivocal emotional support. I didn't add those adjectives in there. She was being very clear that from her research, this is a dangerous and powerful type of relationship. So why are they born? Well, in 1995, an academic paper called The Motivational Effects of Charismatic Leadership was published. And they came up with a theory as to why we do it. There are four reasons. First off, humans are not only motivated by our rational motives, but also by our emotions. Secondly, we're motivated to increase our own self-esteem and self-worth. And thirdly, that that is influenced by our identity. So a politician or a leader that we identify with is going to inspire us. And thirdly, humans may be motivated, and fourthly, humans may be motivated by faith. So if someone can get us to trust in their leadership, and also get us to identify with their cause, or get us to think that they're leading our team, it's a very powerful thing. And this has happened in history, to democracy. Italy in the 1920s is a great example. Mussolini ran on a platform that he would describe pretty well. In 1922, he said, our program is simple. We wish to govern Italy. They ask us for programs, but there are already too many. Speaking of his fascist party, he was saying that, look, we're the best, we're the leaders, and I feel your anger. Put me in power, and I'm going to make Italy great again. He didn't, but in 1924, he secured over 60% of the vote for his side, and he abolished democracy. But you might say, nah, my guy's not this dictator of Italy. My guy's not a fascist. 
My man is a democratic socialist. Okay, well then, let's look at a democratic socialist. Hugo Chavez in Venezuela ran in 1998 on a democratic socialist platform. But he never gave up power, not until 2013. Yes, he won elections, and that was because the poor felt like he was on their side. So what was his legacy? After 14 years of being the leader of Venezuela, he left the country with 32% poverty, according to the World Bank. This is during an oil bull market throughout almost his entire presidency. And according to the U.S. Department of Energy, they have the largest oil reserves in the world. So they at least give economic power to the disenfranchised. Well, according to the Economist Democracy Index, they rank at 95 or 99 last year. They're classified as a hybrid regime, somewhere just below a fluent democracy, but not quite authoritarian. They're the same bracket as Pakistan, Iraq, Myanmar, and Palestine. So it didn't end well for them either, coming from the left or the right. So let's look at our candidates, and I think you're going to see some parallels throughout history. Sanders and other confessed democratic socialists. In June of last year, according to a Gallup survey, 50% of Americans said that they would never vote for a socialist. And yet, when you match this guy up against Trump, he always gets more than 50% of the vote. In fact, in a study published by Maris in April 7th, he got 57% of the vote. Now, did he dramatically swing socialism to be this applauded thing? I don't think so. It seems that people identify with him. They like the fact that he's an outsider. They think that he feels their anger, and regardless of his policies, which just a few months beforehand they hated, they like this guy. The front runner, Donald Trump. He was a Democrat almost all of his life. On social policies, he's still very much liberal, at least from a Republican standpoint. He came in without very talking about many policies. Sure, he had this wall, but did you hear anything about education? Did you hear anything about healthcare, about what it'll actually do with the military budget? No, he's going to make it great. Well, great. Uh, but that's not why they liked him. They didn't like him for the policies they think he's going to put out. They liked him because he was offensive, and they identified with that, and also because they saw him as a leader. A Washington Post survey that in October that told Republicans said that Trump was the favorite leader by 47% of respondents. This is his charisma, his charismatic leadership. It may seem sim tempting to back someone like this, someone that can break the status quo that clearly is getting worse. But if sociology and history have anything to teach us, it's that these don't actually help us very much. Although you identify with these people, and although it would seem great to finally win an election, this is not the way to do it. Vote for bills and regulations and policies that you think are going to matter, and vote based on ideologies, not the way your emotions think you should vote. Thank you very much, and God bless America.